So the criticism over the rollout here in Australia of the vaccinations is widespread. Is this a rinse and repeat situation where without vaccines being delivered more quickly, we are just going to see lockdown after lockdown every time there's a new cluster? I think there's probably a combination of things happening here. You're right, we'll continue to see clusters and need lockdowns until we get better coverage um, of the community with vaccine, but particularly those high-risk workers. And what we've seen is, is a slowness in getting the vaccine out, particularly to aged care. That took longer than they expected. But also the workers haven't been taking advantage of the offer to be vaccinated at any of the, the state hubs and other centres. So that's the frustration, that there's been a, a sort of slowness to all of this. Some of it, people just putting it off, as well as, you know, the, the actual rollout to some of our aged care facilities in particular, taking longer than was anticipated. So combine those things and we, we end up being vulnerable and we've got a, a major outbreak starting to, you know, play out that's actually impacting on aged care. How imperative is it to broaden the age range then for those eligible? We need longer term to, you know, focus on the whole population. This is a whole population response. If you want to slow the, the virus down, you need to focus on all, all parts of the population where transmission is particularly likely. And, and our young, younger adults are one of the key groups there. We saw them overrepresented amongst cases in the second wave in Melbourne last year. Uh, they were overrepresented amongst the essential workers, just as the workers who are still mixing now uh, during the current lockdown often have these young adults with, with little opportunity to be um, vaccinated, but particularly, you know, those, those uh, high-risk workers or those essential workers have been targeted but still haven't necessarily taken up the vaccine. So it's important we cover the whole population. Our strategy was, like all countries, mm -hmm. focus on those most exposed and those most vulnerable. But at the same time, we need to kind of keep those, have a, an express queue for those people to get vaccinated. But we had a situation right. where our hubs were sitting idle. So, you know, we need to keep the vaccine rolling out. So how much does the strategy of snap lockdowns help? Snap lockdowns should only really be brought in when you can't contain an outbreak with contact tracing. So far, the contact tracing has been very impressive. They're concerned because this was an outbreak where they had probably four generations of cases before they knew this was happening in the community, probably five. So that makes it more of a challenge. The, the lockdown is about not trying to squash the virus, but really just slow everything down so it helps the health department assess the situation. And, and now what's unfolding, we've got a lot of exposure sites, but most people are returning negative results, even if they've been mm. at a higher risk exposure site. So that's good news. It's very thorough. And hopefully we won't need to continue the lockdown if they can continue to um, you know, map this outbreak, make sure they've found the edges of it and close it down. Whether it's in Australia or other parts of the world, such as developing nations, we have seen the shortage of vaccines. How effective would it be to switch vaccines around, go from one vaccine to the next available brand? Well, there's very good evidence now coming out that that's a smart strategy. It gives you more flexibility. It allows you to ramp up vaccinations without having to worry about what someone's first dose was. Um, it doesn't seem to have even more mild side effects. You know, it seems to be one that might be a strategy that gives uh, countries more flexibility. And if, if in fact, it does give you a slightly boosted response, then, then that's important for the first rounds of vaccines, but particularly important for the possibility of booster shots needed next year. So, so all of that's actually very encouraging news, just like Pfizer storage now being more relaxed, you don't need to keep it at minus 70 right up to the last two days. It's much more liberal than that now. Um, and so I think all those things help just with the logistics of trying to roll out vaccines around the world. We're hearing now from local reports in Japan that Olympic spectators will be required to show a negative test result. Uh, uh, you know, organisers have said there are ways to kind of mitigate the risk, but when you're talking about still almost 3,000 new cases on Sunday alone for Japan, is holding this kind of mass event foolhardy to you? It's high risk when you've got that many cases in the community, and if you are bringing uh, others in, we know that... The testing isn't infallible. People can be uh, incubating the virus and, and not test positive, but actually have the virus 
you know. So that's always the challenge. In Australia, when we introduced the testing offshore, we find, you know, still somewhere between half a percent and one percent um, turn out to be infected. And so so it's not, not foolproof, but it's less worrying about people coming in than, than the mixing that happens, particularly if you're bringing strains in from around the world, though they mm. tend to travel pretty well themselves anyway. So I think that, you know, it, it, it's, you'd love to hold these events. It takes a lot of work to try and do it safely in these settings, and, and that, that has to be the primary focus. Um, and if it means some events without spectators, then unfortunately that's what you need to do. But the Olympic family itself is large enough between the sports uh, sports people themselves and their their support teams that uh, that it's a mammoth effort to manage something like this. Right. Before we let you go, I just uh, want to get your thoughts on the Wuhan laboratory leak theory being taken seriously again. Just a year ago, this was dismissed as some of those French conspiracy theories. What's your take? I'm not sure we'll ever know where the virus came from, unfortunately. Um, I think people are, are looking back and trying to link anything up. Of course, if you did have, um, and I think the story really revolves around those three scientists who had a pneumonia-like illness, that's that's not proof. And it mm. certainly you know, points people in a certain direction. But what we did hear back from the scientists wasn't um, compelling in terms of this looking or having the, the appearances of being a manufactured virus. So I do think we have to be right. cautious when looking at, at these sorts of more um, circumstantial evidence, which is probably you know pretty pretty weak link at the moment. But I'm sure it's you know with more focus they'll keep looking at it. We might hear more.